Engineering has been around for a while and it's probably one of the oldest jobs in history. But one of the most common questions people always ask is, are there still jobs in engineering? Is it still in demand? The short answer is yes. To prove it, let's look at its history, all the way from the pyramids to AI that's been trending recently. Hopefully after watching this, you'll gain two things. First, you realize that there always was and there always will be a demand for engineering. Second, maybe by learning a little bit about its history, you'll get some ideas on some pretty cool stuff that you can build. The earliest examples of engineering comes from the construction of some of the most ancient structures like the pyramids of Egypt or the Stonehenge in England. Both were built at around 2500 BC, and just in case you're unfamiliar with that terminology, if you look at Earth's timeline, 2500 BC is 2500 years before Jesus was born. Today we live in 2023 AD, which is 2023 years after Jesus was born. Anyways, these massive structures needed a ton of planning and engineering expertise to build. For example, the pyramids in Egypt that were built 4,500 years ago used simple tools and manpower to get it built. They had to lift and move massive stone blocks to build the pyramid. So they developed a number of engineering techniques to do that. These techniques used the use of ramps, levers, and pulleys to be able to move blocks that weighed up to 80 tons. First, let's talk about levers. Levers allow us to lift more weight with less effort, and there are three components involved. The effort, the load, and the fulcrum. There's also three types of levers, first class, second class, and third class. In a first class lever, the fulcrum is between the load and the effort. If the fulcrum is closer to the load, then less effort is needed to move the load. If the fulcrum is closer to the effort, then more effort is needed to move it. A seesaw or a crowbar are some great examples of that. In a second class lever, the load is between the effort and the fulcrum. If the load is closer to the fulcrum than the effort, the less effort will be required to move the load. If the load is closer to the effort than the fulcrum, the more effort will be required to move the load. A wheelbarrow is a common example of this. And in a third class lever, the effort is between the load and the fulcrum. An example of this would be a shovel. By manipulating the forces on a lever, we end up creating mechanical advantage, which basically means I'll be able to move a 100 pounds object without actually exerting 100 pounds of force. If the mechanical advantage is 2, then you'll only be exerting 50 pounds of force to move a 100 pound object. And if you're a mathematical person and like to think with numbers, mechanical advantage tends to follow this equation. Moving on, we can use pulleys to provide mechanical advantage. For example, if you want to lift a 100 pound weight without pulleys, it'll be super heavy. But if you add one more pulley like this, you'll only need to exert 50 pounds of force to lift the 100 pound object. If you add another pulley, you'll only need to exert 33 pounds of force to lift the 100 pound object. And if you add even more pulleys, you only need to exert 25 pounds of force to lift the 100 pound object. Basically, by adding more pulleys, you're increasing the mechanical advantage. So you can see how the use of pulleys and levers was super beneficial in helping them build the pyramids. Moving on, during the Middle Ages, which was between 500 to 1500 AD, there were two key technologies that really made a big impact. First, there was the water wheel, which allowed you to use the power of moving water to operate machines. Second, there were gears, which just like pulleys and levers gives you mechanical advantage. For example, if you have two gears, one with eight teeth, and the other with 24 teeth. If you rotate the small gear at 100 RPM, the larger gear will move three times slower, but it'll have three times greater torque. Again, mechanical advantage just allows you to get a greater outcome while putting in less effort. Next up came the Industrial Revolution around the 18th and 19th century. It was when the steam engine was created around 1775, and it honestly just changed transportation completely. The process starts off by combusting coals, which produces steam. Then the force produced by steam pressure will push a piston back and forth. If you attach this piston to a rod, crankshaft, and flywheel, we can produce rotational motion. As we're talking about the history of engineering and all the pieces of tech that changed the way we work and live, let me introduce to you Notion AI who are sponsoring this part of the video. Notion AI is a personal assistant that can help you write, edit, brainstorm, or summarize your work. 
All this together will help you get work done faster. Also, it's super helpful when it comes to creative thinking. Fun fact, certain parts of the script in this video are written by AI. Here are some things you can ask it to do. First, you can ask Notion AI to handle your first draft about a topic and get ideas that you can turn into something great. Second, it can instantly give you a list of ideas about anything. These ideas can spark your own creativity. Third, it can act as a very precise editor when it comes to spelling, grammar, or even translation mistakes. Fourth, instead of going through large amounts of meeting notes or class notes, it can summarize meeting and documents for you as it pulls out the most important information and action items. Fifth, I recently used it to plan a vacation trip to Hawaii with some of my friends. That's insane. Before AI, I'd have to spend a few hours doing research on the city we're visiting to find the best spots. It's kind of crazy how much power it gives you when writing and how much faster you'll be at getting stuff done. We really went from room size computers to powerful AI in the palm of our hands. I'll put a link to it in the video description. Moving on to the next engineering invention, which first came about in the 19th century would be the phone. Obviously it changed the way we talk with each other and you're probably watching this video on your phone right now. Anyways, you'll notice that most of the inventions so far were mechanical heavy, but at this stage is when electrical engineering starts to get involved. To see what I mean, let's look at the physics or engineering behind the phone. First, when you speak into a phone, your voice or sound will get converted to an electric signal using a microphone. This can happen in one of two ways. First, you can use a dynamic mic. When you talk, you create sound waves which will cause a change in air pressure that will hit this diaphragm which will push the coil up and down the magnet. This will generate electricity. Second, you can use a condenser mic. When you talk, sound waves will cause the diaphragm to move forward and backward. As the distance between the diaphragm and the back plate changes, it will cause the voltage across the capacitor to change. This voltage is the electrical signal that represents the sound wave. Anyways, regardless of which mic you use, once we have an electrical signal, we'll then use an antenna to convert that to electromagnetic waves. This then gets transmitted to a cell tower and redirected to the receiving phone's antenna. We can make a whole video on how this works, but this was just a high level explanation. Moving on, engineering continued to get better with the invention of the plane in 1903 by the Wright brothers. But apparently, according to this video I saw on TikTok, no one actually knows how planes fly. I think they're on unbelief. It's just because we believe planes can fly that they do. So the media has to keep up the pretense or they're just going to start dropping out of the sky. If I were to try to explain it, I'd say we'd have to generate two forces to make planes fly. Thrust and lift. To generate lift, the wings of a plane are designed with a curved shape known as an airfoil. When the plane is in motion, the air flowing over the top of the wing has to travel a longer distance than the air flowing underneath the wing. This causes the air to speed up over the top of the wing, creating a lower pressure area. At the same time, the air flowing underneath the wing slows down, creating a higher pressure area. This difference in pressure creates an upwards force on the wing, which is the lift that keeps the plane in the air. Of course, there are other factors involved as well when the plane is flying, like the actual curved shape of the wing, the speed, or the angle of attack. Second, to generate thrust, we use jet engines, which work by taking in air, compressing it, mixing it with fuel, and igniting it to create a high velocity stream of exhaust gases that push the plane forward. The thrust generated by the engines allows the plane to overcome drag, which is the resistance of the air. Once it overcomes the drag, it can now maintain a constant speed. I hope this makes sense and proves that planes don't just fly based on belief or magic. That's your theory. Around this time, we also had two main generations of computers. The first generation used vacuum tubes and the second generation used transistors. With the generation upgrade, it allowed computers to be smaller and more powerful. I remember in one of my circus classes in university, the professor literally said the transistors were probably one of the most important inventions in the world. And you can see why, since they took our computers from looking like this to looking like that. It's a difficult concept to explain or even understand, so I'll try my best. We took sand, heated it up, and compressed it to form these silicon wafers. You with me so far? On these wafers, we have hundreds of millions of transistors. A transistor is just a binary switch that can be turned on or off. If it's on, it's a one, and if it's off, it's a zero. And if you put a bunch of switches together, they can represent a number. For example, the number five would be three switches in a row, 
on, off, on, or one, zero, one. That's just a basic example, but because you can do math with binary numbers, that means you can also do math with transistors and create circuits using these things called logic gates. Every computer has millions of these, so you can see how we can perform tons of calculations per second. Moving on, can't make a video about the history of engineering without mentioning the internet. Same with Wi-Fi. There's no way that's real. We just have to go along with this pantomime or everything grinds to a halt. The internet works by connecting our devices through communication channels. One of the key components of the internet's infrastructure is the network of underwater cables that connect different parts of the world. These cables, known as submarine communication cables, are usually made up of a bundle of optical fibers and are laid on the bottom of the ocean. Data is transmitted through these cables using light pulses that travel through the optical fibers. These light pulses carry information in the form of digital signals like videos, emails, texts, etc. The cables themselves are like 1-2 to two inches of diameter and will go on for miles. These cables are usually operated by a bunch of internet service providers from all over the world to keep the network running. Without these underwater cables, the internet wouldn't exist. So really, your wireless connection isn't truly wireless. Although certain wireless technologies like satellites or cellular networks can exist in certain areas, they're usually slower and more expensive than the high-speed submarine cables. Finally, the most recent engineering creation would be AI, and it's probably why software engineering is probably the most in-demand type of engineering. But AI really started back in the 1940s or 50s, when people started exploring using the concept of machines to perform tasks that would normally require human intelligence. Then in the 1960s and 70s, engineering researchers developed a number of AI techniques like symbolic reasoning, machine learning, and natural language processing. One of the most famous AI programs back in the day was called ELISA that simulated a conversation between a patient and their therapist. Then in the 1980s and 90s, there was a lot more specialized AI technologies being used like speech recognition. There was also a huge boom in machine learning algorithms like neural networks, which is huge because it allowed computers to learn from data and improve over time. And so because of that, in the early 2000s, data science started becoming a huge thing. They focused on developing algorithms and techniques to analyze large amounts of data and process massive data sets. That being said, just seeing how much AI is booming, you can see that there's a huge demand for software engineers. They can incorporate these AI algorithms into all the apps that we use today. You see how big companies like Notion or Grammarly are starting to incorporate AI in their products? And there's a ton, a long list of websites that also use AI for image recognition, speech recognition, etc. Anyways, obviously, there's much more engineering inventions that came out during this time period, but I couldn't talk about all of them. That being said, one thing you'll notice, though, is engineering started very mechanical heavy, slowly incorporated some electrical engineering, and then and now you can see it's incorporating so much software engineering, which is definitely why software engineering is much more in demand than some of the other types of engineering. For the most part, I feel like we've reached the full potential of mechanical and civil engineering, but there's still a lot more to discover about software and electrical and computer engineering. Anyways, I hope this video brought you value. If it did, check out this video for how engineers tend to build hardware products, or check out that video, which is a day in the life. I'll see you in the next one. Peace! Thank <laughs> you.